Hello and welcome back to Era 7 of the AP U.S. History Curriculum. The growth and prosperity of the 1920s is about to come to a screeching halt with the crash of the stock market in 1929, ushering in one of the most transformative periods in American history. In this video, we will be looking at Topic 7.9, the Great Depression, and in particular, its causes, as well as what the government did to try and address it. So let's get to it. The decade of the 1920s was called the Roaring Twenties, and for good reason. Not only was American culture roaring in terms of styles and social trends, but the economy was roaring as well. It was a time of tremendous prosperity. Per capita income had risen by about 10% for all Americans, but 75% for the nation's wealthiest citizens, creating a vast gap between the rich and the poor. In addition, under the administration of three consecutive Republican presidents, the government adopted policies that were very pro-business. There were low corporate and personal taxes for the wealthy, with more of the tax burden being shifted onto the middle class. President Harding generally believed that business owners would then use that money to invest in business expansion. Instead of paying the government, businesses could be building more factories. Credit was also easy to obtain, and interest rates were low, both of which overwhelmingly favored wealthy investors who, flush with cash, spent their money on luxury goods and speculative investments in the rapidly rising stock market. It was a great time to be rich. New technologies led to a vibrant consumer culture, further stimulating economic growth. But that was also part of the problem. The American economy was built on the production and consumption of goods, but at some point the market becomes saturated and people just don't need to purchase as much, since they already have it. So when newly made items don't sell, they pile up in warehouses, so manufacturers scale back production and fire excess workers. Those individuals then are short on cash and scale back their spending, further reducing the demand for consumer goods. Another inherent weakness to the economy was the situation with America's farmers. In 1920, just under half the nation's population still resided in rural areas, dependent on agriculture for survival, and the Roaring Twenties were unkind to America's farmers. During the years of World War I, farmers had been able to increase their production to feed Europe, whose own farms had become battlefields. Plus, prices had risen due to that demand, along with price supports provided by the government during and immediately after the war. Then in July of 1920, agricultural prices collapsed, largely because of a sudden decline in export demand and the expiring of those price supports. For example, farmers were averaging $2.16 for a bushel of wheat in 1919, but only $1.03 in 1921. For more than a decade, prices went up and down, with the overall trend always down. That wheat example? It was down to just 33 cents a bushel in 1931. The situation was made worse by the overall stability of non-agricultural prices and wages, creating a new gap between farm income and costs. The prosperity of America's cities during the 1920s made rural life all the more painful by contrast. The divide between the haves and the have-nots was basically the divide between the city and country, and the economic resentments created by that divide helped to fuel the powerful traditionalist backlash against modernity. In addition, President Harding believed that low tariffs were hurting American businesses. At least that's what the businessmen were telling him. They feared cheap goods coming from a recovering Europe. So he had signed the Fordney McCumber Tariff in 1922. Tariff rates were increased from the 27% of the Underwood Tariff that had been signed by Woodrow Wilson to an average of over 38%, which was almost as high as the highly protectionist Payne Aldrich Tariff. Duties on farm produce also increased. There were some allowances made for diplomacy purposes, as the president was authorized to make adjustments for individual countries or products as necessary to achieve various diplomatic goals. Kind of like dollar diplomacy. But in nearly all of the cases, adjustments were made upwards rather than downwards. The impact of the tariff was that Europeans' post-war recovery was significantly slowed, and they desperately needed to trade with the U.S. so that they could earn money to pay the debts that they owed the U.S. 
including loans that had been given during the war. In addition, the countries of Europe would also retaliate against the U.S. by enacting tariffs of their own, which of course also affected neighboring European countries and slowed economic recovery even more. Then when the stock market crashed in 1929, triggering a worldwide depression, Europe's fragile economic condition simply couldn't handle the strain, especially Germany. Another significant weakness of the economy was a lack of diversification, with many industries dominated by just a few large companies, and those few also often dominated the stock market in terms of stock sales. Antitrust laws were often ignored, circumvented, or inadequately enforced by the Attorney General's office, which allowed the reestablishment of many monopolies. America's purchasing power was also very much imbalanced. Half of American families could not even purchase the basic necessities of life, including food, housing, and basic consumer goods. Most families were at or near the poverty level, which was classified as those earning approximately $1,000 a year or less. 42% of families made less than this, and 60% made less than $2,000 a year, which would still be considered on the lower end of middle class at the time. Therefore, buying consumer goods on installment plans using credit was becoming more commonplace, meaning a lot of Americans were living well beyond their means to pay for the items that they were getting. The credit and market instability finally culminated in the crash of the U.S. stock market. The Dow Jones Industrial Average had increased 500% in overall value throughout the early and mid-20s, increasing the total value of stock from $450 million to well over $8 billion in collective value. It reached what was then its highest point to date in early September of 1929, and then began a slow decline. That decline would prove catastrophic. The federal government had done little to involve itself in the U.S. economy, especially in the 20s, in keeping with the Republican Party's laissez-faire policies. However, beginning in the spring of 29, even the feds could not ignore the rampant speculation that was going on in terms of rising stock values. So they raised interest rates to try and discourage Americans from buying stock on margin. Buying on margin means that you're getting a loan from your broker to buy stock and then paying off that loan when you sell the stock. But that drove prices upward. The government's attempt failed. A downward trend began in September leading to a crash over several days in October. Investors, concerned about the growing gap between stock values and the actual company's worth, began selling off their shares. On Black Thursday, October 24th, almost 13 million shares were traded. Banks, worried about loans backed by stocks, intervened and bought up shares to prevent prices from falling too far. Trading continued to be extremely high on Friday, where stocks rallied slightly, and again on Monday, when they fell again. Black Tuesday, October 29th, saw over 16 million shares changing hands. Prices began falling again as banks sought to convert the stocks that they had purchased the previous week back into cash. Panicked sellers couldn't find buyers and offered lower and lower prices. However, the banks could not step in and stem this crash because all their reserves had been used the previous week. Many times, the ticker tape that printed out prices so various businesses and individuals could keep track was running hours behind real time. The crash itself was not just the falling of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That was simply a measure of the panic in the number of stock being traded. The crash was really caused by overspeculation in stocks, overexpansion in some industries, overproduction of agricultural products followed by deflated prices, the introduction of credit for a variety of items, and then the collapse of overseas markets due to a bad tariff policy. This all came together to trigger a panic that caused stocks to drop up to 90% in value before the market finally bottomed out. The stock market crash of 29 was not the sole cause of the Great Depression, but it did accelerate the global economic collapse, of which it was also a symptom. By 1933, nearly half of America's banks had failed, and unemployment was approaching 15 million people, or 30% of the workforce. The crash frightened both investors and consumers. Many families lost their life savings, 
They feared for their jobs and worried about paying their bills. Fear and uncertainty reduced purchases of big ticket items like automobiles that people bought on credit. Businesses like Ford Motors saw the demand decline, so they slowed production and furloughed their workers, which was unemployment. And again, 30% of the workforce was unemployed by 1933. As more people became unemployed, they spent less on consumer goods, which caused further contraction of the economy, and this cycle just continued. African Americans were particularly hard hit, since the saying was, last hired, first fired. Women fared slightly better, at least in the areas of nursing and teaching, since those occupations were less dependent on fluctuating markets. Those that were lucky enough to have steady employment often saw their wages cut or their hours reduced to part-time. Even upper middle class professionals like doctors and lawyers saw their incomes drop by as much as 40%. Families who had previously enjoyed economic security suddenly faced financial instability, or in some cases, total ruin. Households embraced a new level of frugality. They kept kitchen gardens, patched worn out clothes, and passed on trips to the movies as they struggled to maintain ownership of a home or a car. Women's magazines and radio shows taught Depression-era homemakers how to stretch their food budget with casseroles and one-pot meals, favorites including chili, mac and cheese, soup, and chipped beef on toast. Some towns and cities allowed for the conversion of vacant lots into community thrift gardens where residents could grow food. Potlucks, often organized by churches, became a popular way to share food as well as a cheap form of social entertainment. People also entertained themselves by gathering with neighbors to play cards or board games. Monopoly was especially popular because it gave pe people a feeling of wealth, which kind of served as a psychological boost. It's also estimated that more than 2 million men and women became traveling hobos. Many of these were teens who felt that they had become a burden on their families and left home in search of work. Riding the rails, illegally hopping on freight trains, became a common yet dangerous way for these individuals to get around. As the Depression worsened and millions of families lost jobs and depleted their savings, they also lost homes. Desperate for shelter, they built shanty towns called Hoovervilles after President Herbert Hoover in and around cities across the nation. These shanties were built of cardboard or tar paper, whatever they could find. Whenever possible, these Hoovervilles were built near rivers for the convenience of a water source. In New York City, for example, encampments sprang up along the Hudson and East Rivers. But these locations were typically pretty grim and unsanitary. They posed health risks to their inhabitants as well as those living nearby. But there was little that local governments or health agencies could do. They really had nowhere else to go, and public sympathy, for the most part, was with Hooverville residents. Even when they were raided by order of parks departments and other authorities, the men who carried out the raids often expressed regret and guilt for their actions, so mostly they were tolerated. Despite how bad conditions were, the federal government didn't have any programs that were designed to help ordinary citizens. Conservatives tended to believe that local communities and charities were the ones to take on that responsibility. The basic philosophy of the Republican Party was one of limited government. So state and local agencies, along with many churches and private charities, did exactly that, helping the poor. Even Al Capone established bread lines and soup kitchens to feed the hungry. But really, the Depression was bigger than these local groups could handle. Compounding the problem of the Great Depression was a massive drought that began in 1931 and lasted for eight years. Dust storms roiled through the Great Plains, creating huge choking clouds that piled up in doorways and filtered into homes, even through closed windows. Even more quickly than it had boomed, the land of agricultural opportunity went bust because of widespread overproduction and overuse of the land, as well as the harsh weather conditions that followed, resulting in the Dust Bowl. Livestock died or had to be sold as there was no money to feed them. Crops intended to feed families withered and died in the drought. For farmers, the results were catastrophic. Many of them lost their land as they couldn't pay their mortgages and their homes were foreclosed upon. One-fourth of the entire state of Mississippi 
was auctioned off in a single day at a foreclosure auction in April of 1932. In hard-hit Oklahoma, many packed up what they could and left. They, along with other displaced farmers from throughout the Great Plains, became known as Okies. Their story was made famous in John Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath. Many traveled to places like California, where the drought was less severe, settling in migrant camps to work the fields there. This influx led to increased hostility towards immigrant workers, many of whom were farm workers from Mexico or the Philippines. So the government began a program of repatriating immigrants. This actually led to the involuntary deportation of over 400,000 people of Mexican ancestry, an estimated 60% of whom were actually American citizens. The threat of unemployment, deportation, and the loss of relief payments led tens of thousands more to leave the U.S. by choice. Hoover's response to the Depression was to call for a spirit of volunteerism, asking him to keep workers employed and requesting the American people to tighten their belts and make do in the spirit of rugged individualism. Eventually, though, he authorized the federal government to give aid to states and charity that were helping the poor and destitute. Eventually, he relaxed his opposition to federal relief and created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which set aside $2 billion to rescue banks, credit unions, and insurance companies, but with very strict requirements, so very few that actually needed help could qualify. It was later expanded to include public works projects, but again, few could qualify. President Hoover had been elected largely on the success and prosperity of the 1920s, that combined with the fact that his political opponent that year, Al Smith, was Catholic, whose religion was very much held against him, especially in rural areas. That's why he had scored such a stunning victory that year. By 1932, though, both Hoover and the Republican Party had become associated with hard times, and no amount of campaigning would change the public's mind. In fact, he was frequently met with antagonism, anti-Hoover signs and protests. Running against him that year was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had been a New York State legislator, an assistant secretary of the Navy under President Wilson, even a vice presidential candidate in 1920, and a very popular two-term governor of New York. He was portrayed as more energetic, more imaginative, and more charismatic than Hoover, and he promised the people a new deal. They didn't necessarily want the new deal. They just wanted a new deal. He portrayed the Great Depression as a domestic problem, and he would win with more than 57% of the popular vote in an election landslide. Historians identify this election as the beginning of a new democratic coalition, bringing together African Americans, other ethnic minorities, and organized labor as a voting bloc upon whom the party would rely on for many of its electoral victories over the next 50 years. FDR's plan would be based around some core beliefs. He believed in positive government action to solve the Depression. He believed in federal relief, public works, Social Security, and unemployment insurance. He wanted to restore public confidence in banks. He wanted stronger government regulation of the economy. And he wanted to directly help farmers. To assist in formulating a variety of relief and recovery programs, Roosevelt turned to a group of men collectively known as the Brains Trust. They helped craft the legislative program that Roosevelt presented to Congress, enabling them to get started within days of his inauguration. FDR's New Deal encompassed a wide range of programs, including stabilizing the banks, creating jobs, raising wages, and investing in public works. The New Deal introduced unprecedented federal government involvement in the economy and society, leading to the establishment of various agencies and programs to provide relief, recovery, and reform. It marked a significant shift in the relationship between the people and the federal government, receiving overwhelming support despite criticism and legal challenges. In effect, it transformed the U.S. into a limited welfare state, providing some basic economic security and limited social benefits focusing on areas such as social security, health, education, housing, and working conditions, with a primary concern for directing resources to the people most in need. We'll look more in depth at the New Deal 
in our next lecture. Well, that's what you need to know about Topic 7.9, The Great Depression. Be sure to keep up with your reading, and I'll catch you in the next video.